Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about section 6.3 entitled Applications of Normal Distributions. All right, uh, recall in section 6.2, uh, it was all about the standard normal distribution. And in a standard normal, the mean by definition is always zero, and the standard deviation by definition is always one. All right, in 6.3, we're going to start talking about non-standard normal distributions. If I was going to write this book, I would probably call it non-standard normal distributions. In other words, how are we going to compute probabilities when our mean might not be zero or our standard deviation might not be one. All right, now well, let's look at, I'm gonna take a, a, a wide view of things. Really there are infinitely many normal distributions. Mm -hmm. They're all bell-shaped by definition. They're all symmetric about the mean value. Well, what determines where a bell peaks in a non-standard normal is, of course, the mean, the location of the mean. Let's consider, let's say uh, three classes, three different statistics classes take the same test. In class one, let's say we compute the mean for that class and the mean is, is 70 and the standard deviation is 10. Oh, let's say, I forgot to mention this, all have all three classes end up with a normal distribution of scores, of test scores. Okay, I want to be sure to mention that. Let's say class two does a little bit better. Let's say class two has a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of five. And let's say class three takes the same test and does meh, overall a little worse as a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of let's say 20. If I was to draw the distribution of all the scores for all three of these classes I might get something that looks like this. Let's say class 1 has a mean of 70. Now all three of these classes are going to have bell-shaped distributions And let's say class one looks something like this. Not too many high values, not too many low values. Most values of scores on this test are in a neighborhood of the mean of 70. Let's say class two. Class two has a mean of 80, so their mean score is higher, but their standard deviation is less, so they still have a bell-shaped distribution of scores but with a sharper peak, less of a dispersion or less of a spread of scores. Class three. Well, overall they did a little worse, at least their mean is worse. All right. They'll peak at about 60. Oh, I forgot to put the uh, mean of 80 here for the class two, okay? Class three with a mean of 60. Well, they're peak of their bell would be at the value 60, but of course they've got a higher standard deviation, so a higher dispersion or higher degree of spread of those test scores. So there's all kinds of normal distributions, and normal distributions are of course characterized by two items, the center and the spread. In other words, by the mean 
and the standard deviation. Okay. All right. So the motive of the uh, motivation for today's discussion is how to compute probabilities in non-standard normal situations. to compute probabilities in the non-standard case, in non-standard normal distributions. And we call in section five, or was it section 6.2 in the standard normal case we use the calculator with the normal CDF command. You would plug in a lower bound of interest and upper bound of interest, close the parentheses, and the calculator would punch it out using the TI 83 or 84. Okay, the normal CDF command that we talked about last time. Well, how about in 6.3, where we've got non-standard situation? In 6.3, we're still going to use this normal CDF command. I'll show you how to use it in a minute. In a non-standard normal, where your mean might not be 0, or your standard deviation might not be 1, uh, we use the same normal CDF command, but with a little bit of a new twist. Uh, if you look in the TI 83 or 84 manual for the formal syntax of the normal CDF command, it'll see something. You'll see something like this. Right. Well, you'll still call up the normal CDF command through the distribution menu. Right? You hit the yellow gold button second then distur above the variables button. You still plug in a lower bound. You'll still plug in an upper bound. But if you look in the TI manual, you'll see something like this. Two other items in brackets, and the brackets typically mean those commands are optional. Well, meaning you don't have to put them in. But if you do not enter in a mean and a standard deviation using the normal CDF command, the calculator assumes you're in the standard case. In other words, the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So let me write that down. If mu and sigma are not specified, and we didn't specify them in the last section, the calculator assumes you are in a standard normal scenario. Okay? In other words, that the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. Well, so that means all we have to do in a non-standard case is to put in an explicit value of mu, the mean, and sigma, the standard deviation, for my non-standard normally distributed variable. Okay? So, jump right in and do an example. This is example 2 on page 266. Let me turn there myself. Alright, you might want to pause and uh, get your books ready. I'm going to read uh, through the example text right now birth weights. Birth weights in the United States are normally distributed with a mean of 3,420 grams and a standard deviation of 495 grams. Alright, so I'm going to write that down. I'm going to let X be a variable that represents all the birth weights of all the babies of all time in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
And the book tells us that all those birth weights are normally distributed, so I'm going to signify this in this fashion with a mean of 3,420 grams and a standard deviation of 495 grams. That sounds about right. At 2.5, about 2.2 pounds per kilogram. Uh, I guess there's about six or seven pounds for a mean weight value. All right. The Newport General Hospital requires special treatment for babies that are less than 2,450 grams or more than 4,390 grams. What is the percentage of babies who do not require special treatment because they have birth weights between 2,450 grams and 4,390 grams? All right, what I'm really asking, the book is really asking us this, all right, with this assumption, birth weights are normally distributed with such and with that given mean and SD we want the probability really of a normal birth weight right? in other words the probability that a randomly selected birth weight is between 2450 grams and 4390 grams that is what we seek okay all right, again, where X is normal, we're in a non-standard case, so all we need to do is use our normal CDF command. 2,450 is going to be our low cutoff. 4,390 is going to be our upper bound. And all I need to do is really plug in the non-standard mean and standard deviation of 3,420 and 495 for the mean and standard deviation respectively. Okay, remember to get to the normal CDF command you've got to hit your second gold button then above the VARS button is the distribution menu and as in the last class uh, this will be the second command in that sub menu just highlight it and select it to call it into your home screen as in the last section. All right, if we punch this out, we get 0.9499 and change. I'm just going to round that off to 0.95 and claim the probability of a birth weight between those given limits is 95, 0.95 or 95 percent. The book asks for a percentage. Okay? So, really a simple twist or a simple add-on to the command, uh, the calculator command we used in section 6.2. Let me get a fresh screen here. Alright. I want to look at another example. This one's in your book, and I believe it's in your homework list, number 29A. We'll do 29B here before we're done today also. So let's flip there, 29A, all right, on page 274. It talks about body temperatures. I'm going to read through the problem and pause if you like. Based on the sample results in data set 2 of Appendix B, assume that human body temperatures are normally distributed with a mean of 98.2 and a standard deviation of 0.62. Alright, so again, I'm going to let X represent a variable that represents all the body temperatures measured, measured in all of time. And the claim is that these body temperatures are normally distributed. Hang on a minute. All right, the claim is that those body temperatures are normally distributed, uh, meaning not too many low ones, not too many high ones. Most body temperatures are within the neighborhood of the mean of 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit, and the standard deviation is 0.62 also in degrees Fahrenheit. 
All right. Part A asks us, Bellevue Hospital in New York City uses 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit as the lowest temperature considered to be a fever. What percentage of normal and healthy persons would be considered to have a fever? Does this percentage suggest that a cutoff of 100.6 degrees is appropriate? All right, what they're really asking us here is what is the probability that a healthy adult would have a temperature greater than 100.6 degrees? So this is really what they're asking for. The probability that a randomly selected adult would have a body temperature greater than 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so this is what we seek. Uh, let me rewrite this because we're going to need an upper and lower bound. This is somewhat similar to things we did in section 6.2. Uh, if you're greater than 100.6 degrees, that means you're between 100.6 degrees and infinity. So remember to use your normal CDF command. You're going to need a lower bound and a theoretical upper bound. Remember, we will use 999999 as our author's suggestion to substitute for infinity. And of course, we're in a non-standard case, so we've got to plug in 98.2 for the mean and 0.62 for the standard deviation. All right, so I'll punch this out, and I get my calculator says something like 5.42 e minus 5. Well, of course, that's 5.42 times 10 to the minus fifth power. This is nothing more than Texas Instruments syntax for this number in scientific notation. And, well, we know how to evaluate that. Well, if you remember scientific notation, if your exponent is negative, the bunny hops if the bunny lives at the decimal point, the bunny hops five spaces to the left. One, two, three, four, five. So I'll have a five, four, two with four zeros between the decimal point and the five. Point zero, 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 five, four, two. Or I would just call it zero plus. Some residual probability, but a very unlikely value, okay? All right, so in this situation, for 29A, the answer would be essentially a zero probability that a healthy person would have such a high temperature, and I suppose that's what we would expect. All right, I also want to look at number 31, similar, somewhat similar example. This is also from your homework list on page 274. Talks about lengths of pregnancies, lengths of human pregnancies. Uh, again, if pause if you like, I'm going to read the problem right now. The lengths of pregnancies are normally distributed with a mean of 268 days and a standard deviation of 15 days. All right, so again, I'm going to let x represent a variable that represents all the lengths of all the pregnancies of all time. And the author claims that these pregnancies are normally distributed. Again, meaning not too many long ones, not too many short ones. Most pregnancies are in a neighborhood of the mean of 268 days and a standard deviation of 15 days. All right, let me read through the problem. Part A, this is part A we're going to be focusing on right now. One classical use of the normal distribution is inspired by a letter to Dear Abby in which a wife claimed to have given birth 308 days after a brief visit from her husband, who was serving in the Navy. Given this information, find the probability of a pregnancy lasting 308 days or longer. What does the result suggest? All right, so assuming everything's okay, we're going to ask What's the probability that a randomly selected pregnancy would last more 
than 308 days in this situation. Okay. Well, again, to use your normal CDF command, you need an upper bound and a lower bound, and then theoretically the upper bound will be infinity here. So let me rewrite this. This is equivalent to the probability that X, our randomly selected pregnancy, is between 308 days and infinity days. I'll call up my normal CDF command from calculator. The lower bound of interest is 308 days. The upper bound of interest, again, we'll use 999, 999 to substitute positive infinity. Don't forget, we've got to specify the mean and the standard deviation because we're in the non-standard normal case. All right, I punch all this out, and I get 0 0.0038. This is the probability that a randomly selected pregnancy would last 308 days or more. All right, now the book says, what does the result suggest? Well, I suppose you could say the, uh, oh, how would you put it? The, um, the wife has a husband, the baby has a father, uh, but this number suggests that those persons are not the same. Okay? Roughly four out of a thousand times might you have a pregnancy that lasts this long. All right. What I want to do now is, uh, like we did in section 6.2, I want to work things backwards now. In other words, we're going to find x values given a known area or probability. Basically working the situation backwards. Let's focus on 31B. We just did the pregnancy problem number 31A. Let's look at 31B. If we stipulate that a baby is premature if the length of the pregnancy is in the lowest 4%, Find the length that separates premature babies from those who are not premature. All right, so a baby is going to be determined premature if it, the length of the pregnancy is in the bottom 4%. All right, we know lengths of pregnancies are normally distributed with a mean of 268 days and a standard deviation of 15 days. Again, the horizontal axis here represents the lengths of all the pregnancies and the enveloping curve represents the distribution of pregnancy lengths in that range. Okay? All right, we are going to form a cutoff. Babies with a length of pregnancy less than this value we're going to call premature and babies with pregnancy lengths longer than this, greater than this, are going to be not premature. All right, and the magic number here is 4%. We're going to claim that if your length of pregnancy is in the bottom 4%, then you're a premature baby, okay? So basically, I'm finding a X score, an X value that cuts off a left tail of 0 0.04 area in this non-standard normal distribution. All right, so this is what I seek. This value right here. Well, you may recall in section 6.2, we had problems similar to this. Uh, we used the inverse normal command when we were given an area and asked to find a z value. And remember, all we had to do is plug in an area to the left, a known area to the left, and hit enter, and our calculator computed this for us. But now in 6.3, we're in the non-standard case. We will use the inverse normal command. Oops, hang on.
we'll still have to plug in a known area to the left. That's the syntax. But again, you're going to have to plug in a mean and a standard deviation. As you might expect, if you don't plug those in, the calculator assumes a standard normal distribution. Okay? Alright, so for here, for this problem, we're going to use inverse normal, let me see, for the above example. The cutoff value we seek is going to be calculated with this calculator command. The inverse norm command, you recall, you go to the distribution menu and I believe it's the third function down on that submenu. Plug in your area to the left, which here is 0 0.04, and of course the mean for pregnancy lengths is 268, and the standard deviation for pregnancy length is 15 in days. All right? So we punch this out, and we get, well, I'm going to call it 242 in days. I've lost the above diagram. Let me resketch it here quickly. X is a variable that represents all the pregnancy lengths of all time. Pregnancy lengths are normally distributed with a mean of 268 days. If I want to have a cutoff for premature babies, it's going to have to separate the bottom 4% from the top 96% in terms of length of pregnancy. And we found out from the calculation above that that cutoff is going to be for 242 days. So question mark, the cutoff value that we want is 242 in days. Okay. Alright, I want to do one more example, somewhat similar, also involving uh, a problem from the homework. We did part A earlier. This is the body temperature one. Let me get a fresh screen here. This is 20. We already did 29A. I want to look at 29B now. And this is also on page 274, of course. All right. Body temperatures based on the sample results and data set 2 of Appendix B assume that body, human body temperatures are normally distributed. With a mean of 98.2 and a standard deviation of 0.62 as before. Now part B, physicians want to select a minimum temperature for requiring further medical tests. What should that temperature be if we want only 5% of healthy people to exceed it? All right, so X represents all the body temperatures of all healthy people of all time. The author claims those body temperatures are normally distributed with a mean of 98.2 and a standard deviation of 0.62 in degrees Fahrenheit. All right, we want to select a minimum ten temperature for requiring further tests. All right, well, some people run hotter or colder than others. All right, we want to set a minimum temperature that will require further tests, and the condition is we want only 5% of healthy people to exceed it. All right, so that means if we set this cutoff up here, it's going to cut off a right tail area of 0 0.05 under this normal distribution. Now the total area under any probability distribution curve is going to be 1. So if I've got a right tail of 0 0.05, of course my area to the left is going to be 0 0.95. 
Now remember that inverse normal command, the syntax of it assumes that you enter in the area to the left. So with a little detective work, I can determine with a right tail of 0 0.05, I must have an area to the left, of course, of 0.95. So I'll find my needed area, my needed, sorry, my needed X score right, with the inverse norm command. So it's going to be inverse norm 0.95, the mean is 98.2, the standard deviation is 0.62, and I punch that out on my calculator and I get a cutoff of approximately 99.2 in degrees Fahrenheit. That is the cutoff. If your temperature is higher than that, you're going to have to undergo some further testing. All right, so uh, roughly uh, logically equivalent to stuff we've done in 6.2, but again with that new twist of adding means and standard deviations into previously used commands uh, in the non-standard situations. All right, so that concludes. We're hitting the approximately 32-minute point. So we'll call it a day for this section. And this concludes section 6.3, Applications of Normal Distributions.